it is my pleasure to welcome and to, to invite and to welcome Professor Thierry Noguet from University of Perpignan, France. Uh, Professor Thierry Noguet um, has received his PhD, is professor of uh, biochemistry at University of Perpignan, but in the same time, the head of uh, Biosensor Analysis and Environment Laboratory uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, he received his PhD in agrochemistry in uh, 1997, and uh, he was uh, a postdoctoral fellow in laboratory of Professor Isao Karube, the great Professor Isao Karube, uh, named uh, Mr. Biosensor, <laughs> as I know, and uh, who unfortunately passed away uh, in 2020. But uh, due to this uh, fellowship, I suppose Professor Thierry Noguet was established several uh, collaborator collaborations between uh, different uh, specialists from Japan and France, and not only. Um, Professor uh, Thierry Noguet, uh, for 20 years uh, of uh, activity in uh, biomem. Uh, in, uh, in uh, previously in Imagis uh, laboratory and now biosensor analysis and environmental uh, laboratory um, has uh, performed activities and uh, they have uh, recognized expertise in development of uh, innovative analysis tools for uh, agri-food sector and environmental. He is uh, leading a multidisciplinary uh, team consisting in uh, chemists and uh, biologists and um, that acquire expertise in developing biosensor based on different biological and biomimetic uh, receptors. And uh, this team, uh, headed by Professor uh, Thierry Noguet, established several uh, partnerships with other university and uh, international uh, institution being involved in uh, six European programs or interregio uh, actions and nine bilateral exchange programs since 2008. Uh, they are also collaborating with several companies from uh, France, Netherlands, and uh, Spain. So Thierry, welcome, and thank you for accepting this invitation. Thank you so much, Anna, for this nice presentation. It's a pity I cannot be here today in Bucharest, but hopefully uh, next year I will be able to be there and to see you in the world. <laughs> um, I want to thank you and uh, thank all the organizers also for inviting me for this nice conference. Um, I will share my start to share my screen. Uh, I hope it will work. Is it okay? Yeah? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so thank you so much. So today I will present you um, some new insights concerning affinity uh, biosensors. And I will give you uh, through my talk a few examples of, of the work that have been done in our lab. So for if some people don't know uh, what is a biosensor, let me introduce rapidly uh, the, the definition of a biosensor. So a biosensor is an analytical device, uh, integrated analytical device, which is usually portable, that uh, combines the use of a recognition element, which is often called bioreceptor, with a transducer. The bioreceptor is in charge of recognizing the target in the, in the complex medium, and the transducer uh, is able to convert the recognition signal into a measurable uh, analogical, analogic signal. So uh, generally, the recognition element can be divided in two main categories, uh, namely catalytic and non-catalytic bioreceptors. Catalytic uh, bioreceptors are in the great majority enzymes, but also they can be cells, organites, and so on. And non-catalytic bioreceptors are generally antibodies, but they can also be oligonucleotides like aptamers, uh, st strands of DNA, RNA, or even protein receptors or peptides. So, 
Um, enzymes, in fact, are considered as ideal recognition molecules due to their several advantages because there are a lot of uh, variety, a great variety of enzymes that are available, first of all. They are highly specific uh, and they, they lead to a huge amplification of the signal due to the very high turnover of uh, their reaction. For example, everybody knows the glucose biosensor that you use for decades to detect the, the, blood, uh, the blood glucose for diabetics. Uh, this is an uh, enzymatic biosensor. And also using enzyme, there is a possibility of detecting uh, both using optical and electrochemical detection. Electrochemical detection being the one that is uh, generally uh, developed in uh, commercial biosensors. The main drawbacks are of uh, enzyme as recognition molecules is due to their relative instability because they have a proteic nature. Generally, enzymes are proteins. Uh, so they are thermolabile. Um, they are sometimes uh, costly to produce, and uh, moreover, they are used only to detect substrates or inhibitors. So in some cases, there is a real need to find alternative uh, receptors that I will call, in this case, affinity receptors. So Generally, affinity receptors uh, are antibodies uh, based on, the, on their use uh, in uh, immunoassays and mainly in ELISA uh, immunoassays. So ELISA immunoassays can be uh, developed in different ways. Direct ELISA is based on the use of uh, uh, an antibody which is labeled with an enzyme and which is used to uh, bind an absorbed antigen. Indirect ELISA, ELISA is based on the same system, but using a secondary antibody, which is used to, uh, to, to reveal the binding of the first antibody. And finally, sandwich ELISA is based on the use of a capture antibody, which is used to fix the antigen and then another antibody which is labeled with the enzyme. In all the cases, the activity of enzyme is revealed by the substrate and there is a colored product that is obtained and the absorbance or the correlation, depending on the product of this product is proportional to the concentration of the antigen. So these systems are very nice. They are very good affinity and specificity, uh, but they can be used only for the detection of real antigens. That means that you, the target molecule must be big, uh, the size of a protein or something like that, or, or polysaccharide. And that means that it can be either adsorbed. And furthermore, in the case of sandwich, you need to uh, bind two different antibodies on the same uh, antigen. So you need several epitopes it is not applicable to uh, small molecules. That's the reason why competitive ELISAs have been developed. Competitive ELISAs exist in two forms. The first one consists in a competition between fixed uh, target derivative and free target uh, for the binding on antibodies that are labeled with an enzyme. In the, in this case, also the uh, fixed antibodies, of course, are revealed by the presence of the substrate of the enzyme. And the other formats use uh, immobilized antibodies and competition between the free target in red and the target which is linked to an enzyme. So in the same way, the activity of the enzyme is revealed with a substrate and a correlation is obtained. In this case, in this case, the coloration is uh, uh, inversely proportional to the concentration of the uh, target. The more you have target, the less the, co the coloration is intense. So these systems are also highly specific and uh, with high affinity due to, the use, due to the use of antibodies. And they allow the detection of aptens. That means small molecules that are not 
uh, normally immunogenic. The problem uh, of these systems is that uh, the synthesis of immunogenic derivatives is mandatory to produce the antibodies. And uh, for, uh, in consequence, the selection of antibodies uh, specific to this apten is difficult and time consuming. So how can we pass from immunoassays to immunosensors? This is what we call the transducing issue. We have to find ways to, uh, to, to measure the interaction between the an antibody and, and the target. So uh, there are two main types of uh, immunosensors that have been developed, optical immunosensors and electrochemical immunosensors. Um, I will deal with electrochemical immunosensors in this speech, but optical immunosensors are generally based on the same principle as ELISA with measures of absorbance, fluorescence, luminescence, depending on the type of, uh, of molecule detected. There are also systems, immune, uh, optical systems that are, are based on surface plasma resonance uh, measurement. But to my opinion, these systems cannot be called really biosensors as they are not portable, uh, no usable or on site. Uh, and uh, they are, uh, also adapted to, to big molecules, not to, to small targets. So I will deal here with the electrochemical immunosensors that are uh, the most important in terms of uh, publications and uh, applications. Electrochemical immunosensors can be developed in several uh, ways. Uh, uh, the two main um, systems developed are based on electrochemical impedance spectroscopy measurements. Um, they are label-free uh, detection. The problem is that they are poorly sensitive to low molecular weight molecules. It's difficult to detect small molecules uh, like metabolites or uh, small pollutants like pesticides and so on. And the second method are, is voltammetric methods with several methods in this family which are highly sensitive and reproducible, um, but uh, very often they require the use of uh, electrochemical label uh, fixed either on the target or on the antibody. So based on these, uh, on these uh, concepts, we have developed in the lab uh, several immunosensors. I will present here a few of them. So um, first of all, we have, de we have developed recently uh, an immunosensor for the detection of chlortoluron, which is an herbicide. Uh, it's a substitute UAR, which was used um, in place of atrazine when atrazine was forbidden. So uh, this project was carried out in collaboration with Suez O, which is a company of uh, water in France, and Dijon Metropole because they, have, they had some problems of uh, the presence of these uh, pesticides in groundwaters. So we developed a, a P, uh, PhD on this topic. And uh, in this PhD, uh, we developed a, a, an immunosensor that was based on the competitive uh, method as described uh, before. Uh, in this method, uh, the uh, derivative of chlorotoluron Chlortoluron was immobilized on the surface of the electrode using butin-avidin interaction. And the, and the competition was done with antibodies and free, and free, uh, free pesticide. Of course, the uh, binding of the antibody on uh, the chlortoluron derivative was revealed by the presence of a secondary antibody, which was uh, marked with an enzyme and the injection of the substrate of the enzyme gave a product that was detected electrochemically. In this case, the product was a TMB uh, that in the oxidized form that was reduced at minus 0 0.2 volt versus a GHCM. So in this case, as you can see here, the, the response decreases when the concentration of chlorotoluron increases. And we, have, we obtain a response in the range uh, from 0 0.01 to 10 micrograms per liter with a LOD of 22 nanograms per liter. 
uh, the European regulation uh, fixed the limit uh, at 0 0.1 microgram, sorry, per, per milli per liter. So the, the sensor was uh, adapted to the detection of these uh, of these compounds in groundwaters. Um, we also uh, tried the cross reactivity, and there was no cross reactivity and also absence of uh, matrix effects using real samples. We used also an electrochemical immunosensor for the detection of an antibiotic uh, from the fluoroquinolone family. These antibiotics are commonly found in uh, meat or from animals, so in food. Uh, and we uh, made this uh, this research in the frame of uh, Interreg Poctifa uh, project with partners from from Spain. In this project, we analyzed more than five thousand samples from of meat from Spain and France uh, using different methods, and we compared our results. So we were in charge of developing the immunosensor. And so we, de we developed the immunosensor based on the competition, in this case, using immobilized antibodies and competition between the, the target. So in this case, it's the uh, it's, um, antibiotic and the target that we, a target derivative that we modified using an electrochemical probe. In this case, we used diflux difluxacin, sorry, an analog of the target that was uh, modified using a ferrocene. And of course, the ferrocene was detected by oxidation at 0.2 volt versus a GHGCL. Using this system, we succeeded in detecting the, the fluoroquinolone in, at very low concentrations with a LOD of three nanograms per, millil per milliliter, sorry. And the immunosensor show uh, quite satisfying uh, stability for one month. Uh, and also it displayed a very good specificity for other fluoroquinolone because it's not interesting to detect only this one, but all the family of fluoroquinolone. So that was a very good result. Hopefully uh, we found very, uh, <laughs> a very low percentage, uh, 5%, uh, less than 5% of uh, meat that contained low, low quantities of uh, fluoroquinolone. Uh, we also de de developed immunosensor for uh, estradiol and etinyl estradiol, which are estrogen uh, molecules. The one, the first one is natural, the second one is the one used in the contraceptive pills. Uh, these uh, compounds were detected in water, and in this case, we, we used a derivative of, of estrogen that was bind, bound sorry, on magnetic beads. Magnetic beads were maintained on the surface of the sensor using a magnet, and the uh, competition was made with antibodies, of course, uh, that bound with the free target, the one that we want to detect, or to the immobilized um, molecule. There is a competition, of course, and the more the concentration of the, of the target is high, uh, the lower is the binding of the antibodies on the surface. So in this case also, we made the revelation using the uh, anti-antibody labeled with an enzyme. In this case, the enzyme was alkaline phosphatase. We use as a substrate naphthyl phosphate and we detected naphthol. Um, and in this case, we obtained very nice, um, very nice, uh, um, sorry, uh, detection ranges with estradiol and etinyl estradiol with a respective uh, detection limits of one and 10 nanograms per liter uh, for these two compounds. There was no cross reactivity with other hormones due, due to the high specificity of the, of the antibodies used for each, uh, each compound. 
So uh, in a, in a second uh, step, we we wanted to 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 move from the the enzyme uh, labeling and to use other labeling system. That's reason why we tried uh, as labels to use uh, redox compounds. So uh, in the first step, we 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 try to use uh, oxovanadium complexes uh, named salen and salan. Salan being the reduced form here of saline compounds. Uh, and these complexes were, uh, sorry, these ligands were complexes with oxovanadium. Um, oxovanadium complexes were bound to estradiol and we made a competition between these uh, derivative uh, of uh, estradiol, which is chemical, uh, electrochemically active and free estradiol. Uh, antibodies, anti-estradiol, being immobilized on the surface of the electrode. We demonstrated that the saline complexes show higher stability and better reproducibility, and moreover, a, a higher signal enhanced electroactivity compared to saline uh, compounds. That's the reason why in the following, we used only saline complexes. And uh, the, the system, the immunosensor that we developed, allowed the detection of estradiol at concentrations from four nanograms per liter to five micrograms per liter. So quite huge uh, range, uh, co comparable to the one obtained with um, enzymatic labeled system. So we simplified considerably the system and the number, also the number of steps uh, for the measurement. Okay, so we developed several uh, sense, uh, immunosensors, but there are still may, uh, some drawbacks of using antibodies. These drawbacks are the high cost. It is extremely expensive to use antibodies. There are proteins, so they can be easily denaturated. There is also the problem of ethics with, uh, because they, they are produced by preliminary by animal, uh, animal, animal production. Um, they can lose their activity uh, due to some conditions, variations of pH and so on. And they are limited to, uh, they have limited applications. Uh, generally, uh, it's difficult, as I told you, to, to make uh, antibodies for small molecules. So there is a, a big trend to find alternatives to antibodies. Several uh, solutions are possible. But in this talk, I have chosen to, to, to deal uh, with uh, uh, aptamers, DNA aptamers, and molecularly imprinted polymers. Uh, you can find other alternatives, some uh, peptides, uh, AFI bodies, uh, special proteins, peptidic nucleic acids, and so on. But I will only uh, talk about uh, MIPS and aptamers. So first, aptamers. Uh, aptamers are, in fact, uh, oligonucleotides, a single strand uh, of DNA or RNA. Uh, generally, now we use um, majoritarily DNA because it's, they are more stable. Uh, and these uh, uh, aptamers are selected to bind in a very specific way, in the same way as uh, antibodies, to uh, a, a target by adopting a specific three-dimensional structure. So how do aptamers are selected? They are selected using a process which is called SELEX for systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. The method is um, the following. The, the target in blue here is put in contact with a, a great number of oligonucleotides, which is called a library of oligonucleotides with uh, different uh, sequences, of course. And we select during these cycles, the aptamers that bind to the target. We select the aptamers, we amplify them, uh, and the aptamers that were uh, selected are put again in presence of the target, and by uh, reducing the contact time and so on, at the end, we uh, succeed in isolating 
some dozens of aptamers that are candidates for uh, being used as recognition elements. These candidates are sequenced, so we determined their sequence, so they can be easily reproduced by chemical synthesis afterwards. And of course, they are, they are, they are tested for their ability to bind the target uh, in, in vitro. So the main advantage of, of aptamers compared to, to antibodies are, the, are due to the fact that they are prepared in vitro, they uh, are easier, uh, the selection is easier and shorter compared to antibodies. There is no batch to batch variation because a, a sequence of aptamer is always uh, the same. It's not, uh, well, it's easy to, to reproduce. It's stable in the form of, uh, in the dry form. Uh, we can detect, we can, sorry, select aptamers for a great variety of targets. Some people uh, have selected uh, aptamers for ions, other from wool cells. So there are a very huge variety of potential targets. The specificity of aptamers is comparable to the one of, of uh, antibodies. And uh, the main advantage uh, in the aim of developing aptas sensors is that aptamers can be chemically modified um, at generally at each end for uh, either immobilization or signaling purposes. So we can put a specific um, chemical functions to either immobilize or fix some uh, molecules that are used for, for, uh, for the, as labels for, for, for the, for the signal. The main drawback, um, well, are uh, related to the a possible lack of selectivity. Uh, that's the reason why during uh, the SEDEX protocol, we use generally counter selections uh, using uh, the molecules that we don't want <laughs> to detect uh, instead of using the, the, the target that allows to, to discard all the aptamers that, we, we uh, that are susceptible to bind to these molecules. There are also the problem of possible misfolding that is uh, because aptamers are recognize their, um, their target in a three-dimensional form. So in this case, there is a loss of a re recognition. Um, the other problem is that it's difficult with aptamers to predict the effect of binding of the target. So sometimes uh, <laughs> it can be a problem. And also, um, as the aptamers are generally selected in, uh, as in free forms, when you immobilize them on the surface of electrodes, you, you may have some possible change of uh, behavior in the presence of, of the target. So these are the potential drawbacks. So how to pass to electrochemical aptas sensors? It's quite easy because uh, aptamers work more or less like, uh, like antibodies. So generally we use the same detection principles as immunosensors. Um, as for immunosensors, the detection of small targets is tricky. It's difficult. Sometimes using uh, electro electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, uh, it can work, especially if the target is electroactive, but it's not always the case. So that, uh, like in the case of uh, immunosensor, the labeling of aptamer or the target is very often required and uh, we, we fall in the competitive assays like uh, for, for immunoassays. Another strategy sometimes used is to, is to involve a complementary strand of the, of the aptamer, uh, which binds by complementarity to the aptamer, and which is removed when the target binds the aptamer. So this method is called the displacement method. It, it, it's sometimes used also, but we do not, we do not use it in the lab. So uh, in the lab, we detected, uh, we detected, <laughs> we developed uh, APTA sensors for several targets. Um, we keep on uh, speaking of estradiol because uh, <laughs> it, it is one of the of the of, of the targets that we uh, 
that we detected using both immuno and APTA sensors. So we developed exactly the same, the same format as for with the immuno sensor, except that we use immobilized APTA sensor that is labeled with an electrochemical label. And the electrochemical label is the same as described before, is a salon complex of, of oxovanadium. Oxovanadium is missing in this, uh, in, the, in, this uh, in, in this, in this shim. Uh, we have to add uh, oxovanadium here. And of course, uh, in the presence of the target, the aptamer change of configuration and the signal is modified. In fact, what we observed with this APTA sensor is that in the absence of a target, we have a big signal due to the oxidation of oxyvanadium complex. And when the target binds to the aptamer, the aptamer unfolds and there is a decrease of the signal due to the, uh, the, the oxovanadium complex. So as you can see here on the, on, the, on the right, the more the concentration of S-radiol increases, and the, the more the, the peak due to the oxidation of uh, the oxovanadium complex decreases. This is uh, how this aptamer behaves, but not all the aptamers behave in the same way. Uh, we also tried to use another uh, compound to label the aptamer to show, uh, to see if the, the aptamer behaves in the same way. In this case, we use uh, triazole uh, ligands, bistriazole ligands of copper. Uh, this uh, complex was bind through a spacer arm to maleimide, which was used to fix the tiol end of the aptamer. So the aptamer was fixed through this is end here, and the other end was an amino end that was immobilized on the surface of the electrode here. So in the absence of target, we measured a high signal due to the uh, configuration of the of the aptamer, and in the in the presence of the of the target estradiol, we observed a decrease of the signal as shown in the previous slide. So um, even with changing the way of uh, of labeling, the 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 aptamer behaves in this case in the same manner. So we obtained a very nice calibration curve uh, and we were able to detect it concentrations in the micromolar range. So um, another um, possibility to, to, to replace uh, antibodies is to use molecular imprinted polymers. These polymers are even often called plastic antibodies. Uh, they are made uh, by polymerization uh, around a template molecule that is, in fact, is a target of, of, the, of the assay. Um, after polymerization, the molecule is removed and it leaves some cavities in the polymer that are able to specifically bind again the, the, the target molecule. So uh, MIPS can be used for several applications, including extraction, concentration. So in this case, they are used as a columns, but also they can be used in sensors as recognition molecules. And uh, that's uh, somehow interesting to, to develop uh, MIPS sensors because uh, they have some advantages. Uh, they are quite uh, inexpensive. It's not so, so, so costly to fabricate uh, MIPS. They have a high bending capacity. They are very strong. They are, you can use uh, the several pH, pressure, temperature conditions. They have a very high stability. Um, they have a good selectivity, not comparable exactly to antibodies, but uh, for some MIPS, it's quite satisfying. And we can also develop them for a great variety of, of targets. Their drawbacks is their possible uh, lack of selectivity. 
sometimes a low repeatability because it's difficult to reproduce the same uh, fabrication of atom of uh, sorry of MIPS. Um, in some cases, the synthesis, the condition of synthesis may change the final affinity, uh, mainly if the, the structure of the, of the target molecule is affected by the polymerization. And also uh, another drawback is that you cannot uh, make uh, MIPS for living cells. It's not uh, compatible. Um, how to develop uh, electrochemical sensors. We have tried in the lab to develop electrochemical sensors, but I do not have a lot of time to speak of this. So um, there are several issues. The, the, detect, the direct detection of, uh, of the target using MIPS is uh, difficult. Uh, as with other methods, uh, we have uh, already used uh, uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. It's working in some case, but not always. Voltammetric methods, well, in fact, the, 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 ease, the ease of transduction depends on the target molecules that you want to detect and its electrochemical properties. If the target molecule is electroactive, it's quite easy to, to, to detect it using a MIP, otherwise it's uh, more complicated. Um, what is also complicated somehow is to uh, integrate the MIPS in the in the electrode the core in the either on the surface or in the electrode material. Uh, it's the, the problem is that it's difficult to incorporate it in a homogeneous way and in a reproducible way to not have a great variation between electrodes. So these are the main issues. Uh, the current trends and perspectives for developing MIP sensors are very, uh, very num numerous. There are many uh, research uh, groups in the world that work uh, on MIPS uh, development. Uh, to my opinion, there are two interesting ways. The first one is to develop electrochemical MIPS. Uh, that should uh, incorporate uh, redox compounds in the MIPS uh, polymer structure in the core so that the, the binding of the target molecule could, could uh, switch off the, the, the electrochemical signal due to the redox compounds. This is one, one possibility. There is a, in France a group in Toulon work which, who is working on this. Uh, uh, in this direction. And also um, another possibility is it's a project that we developed with another lab in Perpignan who is a specialist of uh, peptidic synthesis, is to develop uh, peptidic MIPS uh, by incorporating in the, in the MIPS uh, structure some uh, electroactive amino acids um, that allows to make uh, to, to make more possibilities of interactions um, between the target and the MIPS, and also by the same way as uh, some amino acids are electroactive, uh, be able to detect the binding of the target on the MIPS uh, more, more 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 easily. So these are the two main. Uh, perspective that uh, I, I find interesting, but for sure there are many others. And uh, well, there are, there are, as I told you, there are many groups that are very, very good in developing uh, MIPS. We are not, this is not our, our real specialty. Okay, so as, uh, as you can see, there is still a lot of work to do. And uh, of course, uh, I, I didn't present all the all the possibilities of developing sensors. Otherwise, I, I need uh, several hours. <laughs> thank you so much for your attention, and I want to thank you all my collaborators uh, from Perpignan and from other labs. Thank you, Thierry, for your nice presentation. Congratulations! I know that it's a huge work performed during several years and not only and you are in a type and you are trying to be uh, how to say uh, uh, 
as new as possible <laughs> with several things as you do. Uh, if uh, there are some questions, <laughs> please, Mr. Varaki. <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Niki Barakio. I'm engineering electronics, but I work no more than chemical sensors. For this is amazing what you present for me, and the congratulations, excellent work, excellent presentation. I could understand something more about biochemical <laughs> sensor. It's very important for me because here I start cooperation with uh, uh, biosensing teams. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, maybe are two. Uh, first, you said that you measure by PCR to optimize, yeah? Uh, no, no. PCR hmm. method. The PCR method. Ah, sorry, chemical. It's the same method as in COVID. The PCR method is used in the in the process of uh, selecting the optimizer. Yes. Yeah. yes. To, to amplify the, okay. the candidates that can bind to the, to the target. My That's... question is, it's the same method as in COVID? Yes, in yes. Principle. Why, yes. Why I put the question? No, no. Uh, okay, my question is, it's a, uh, I, I, I ask the question, I, I, I tell you the context and I, Ask now a question because you do, you repeat the processes. Yes. One, two, three. Yeah. Here. This process? One, two, three. You repeat steps. Yeah. We repeat it uh, several cycles from five. Yes, that is my question. It depends. Yeah. Why, why I put the question? What happens in the beginning of the COVID? Uh, um, they measure 30 times, and it happens to a friend of mine who is. Uh, physician in the Institute of Infectious Diseases, when it was negative, they put 40 times and it is positive. And this was an oscillation. And discussing with him, I'm tell an electrical terms, I, I, I told him, I suppose you measure uh, something like a noise. And I find that it was, they measure some dead viruses and uh, they stay more two weeks and it was very bad because the uh, wife became some problem with depression. My question is, do you have some methods when to stop this? Because it was very tough with COVID not to stop the cycle of amplification. Do you have some criteria when you, it's okay to stop this, to repeat these steps, to have a good, how to say, answer, and not to measure such a kind of noise as I tell in, in electrical terms? Well, um... It depends. In fact, we we control uh, we control the the the, the advan advancement by uh, by um, electrophoresis to to know uh, the the amount if the amount of uh, DNA is in, is sufficient. But it's not at all the same application than for COVID detection, where you need to detect very low amounts of uh, of DNA or RNA. Uh, it's it's not at all the same the same the same uh, method. So it means you have enough uh, enough criteria to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, our only goal is to increase the the concentration of uh, okay. of of aptamers that we have selected to to to, to make them uh, majority in the in the in the the mixture that we will represent to the to the. Um, to the target at each cycle and by reducing the time of contact at each cycle we will at the end select only the aptamers that have the strongest affinity with the target okay so at each cycle we eliminate for example uh, the green color option and then the the black one okay <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. And, and also, <laughs> yeah. Donnie explained to me in parallel, and I know it gets the point. Other question, as yeah. you know, and it happens also to chemical sense that we move the needle, we are happy, but after we find it's not selective. You yeah. say to Aptamer next slides that you have a method. I didn't get the method in a red. Okay, counter selection recommended. How you do that? Because could be yeah. applied to yeah. chemical yeah. sense. What uh, it means that if in, in this process, it. in this process here. Uh, well, if you you select, for example, these aptamers, the, the green, the blue, and so on, these aptamers, 
for example, during the, the fifth round, instead of presenting your target, you present the molecule that you want uh, not to be bind to the to the final. Uh, Interesting. Okay, so by this way, you will eliminate all the aptamers that bind both molecules. Ah, interesting. Like maybe opposite to put a filter for chemical sensor, not to come in other chemicals that could influence and you don't like to measure mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in mirror maybe method. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's, it's the same way that uh, when, when when making uh, immuno immunoassays, uh, you uh, you select the antibodies by the same way. Uh, you... Okay, thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. interesting, thank you so much. You're welcome. If there are some other questions in uh, or in online, if no, I would like to ask you comparing from MIPS to Aptam sensors and immunosensors the array usability of them is it possible to reuse um i know some people some people succeed to reuse some immunosensors or some uh, even after sensors uh, potentially the more re reusable could be uh, mip sensors due to their nature because uh, you can use uh, harsh conditions to re regenerate them and to remove the to remove the, the target once it's bound. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I, I, I'm not sure that the re re reusability is the uh, best quality of these, <laughs> of these systems, <laughs> not at all. That's the reason why we develop uh, disposable uh, systems. Uh, once used, it uh, it's oh, drops yeah. away. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Terino. Uh, it was uh, it was really we enjoyed your presentation, and we hope that the next year you will uh, come here and uh, maybe to discuss uh, uh, opportunities for uh, some European projects. Because we have uh, this group uh, for Santa Maria is uh, uh, here, and maybe uh, we can. Uh, find some uh, opportunities to to apply together. It will be with pleasure. I, I would like to come. Please send me the inv invitation a uh, few uh, more in time. people. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please, uh, if you have time, uh, maybe you can uh, lo uh, log in uh, to our conference tomorrow also, because we Okay, have I will try, yes. Uh, tomorrow I, I'll teach in the morning, but uh, maybe. <laughs> okay. Thank you so <laughs> thank much. You, thank you very much. Have a nice, have a nice evening. Thank Bye -bye. you.